We started last Sunday morning on the matter of understanding current events and the end times, Bible prophecy, and how it dovetails and how we can understand where we are in the journey. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, and if you turn there, I just want to make reference to a verse of Scripture, Matthew 24. A couple of verses of Scripture. Just before we read, we emphasize the fact last week that the Lord will return. We dealt with the fact that He came once in fulfillment of the promise of God, Genesis 3.15. We, we looked at the fact that God raised up a nation of people through whom Jesus will come into the world. And between the creation of man and the birth of the Lord Jesus, a period of approximately 4,000 years elapsed. The Old Testament deals primarily with the nation of Israel, its ups and downs, its rebellion and obedience, its blessings and punishment during this period of time. God raised them up from one man and built a, a nation to whom he gave his oracles, his teachings, and with whom he made a covenant relationship. Through that covenant relationship, and is listed in Deuteronomy chapter 28, he said, if you will carefully, or if you will fully obey, and carefully follow the words that I give you, my instructions, my laws, my injunctions, my statutes. He says that all of these blessings will come upon you and will overtake you. And it's all listed in Deuteronomy 28. That was the, <coughs> the benefit of the covenant relationship. But with any covenant, there are not only benefits, there are obligations and responsibilities. And so they were obligated to obey and to follow what God instructed them to do. And he says, if you don't do it, then all of these blessings will be reversed. They will be, you instead will be cursed. So in the journey of Israel, and that's what the Old Testament is about, we see them rise in strength and victory and prosperity and prominence. And we see them become slaves, the people of God. We saw the nations that rose up to fulfill that plan to enslave them when they rebelled against God. But it did not interfere with God fulfilling that first messianic promise that he made in Genesis 3.15. And so when the time was fulfilled and all of the circumstances were right because the prophecies in relation to his first coming had to be fulfilled and they were all fulfilled accurately. Like where he was to be born. For example, Christ could be born nowhere else but in Bethlehem of Judea. But for hundreds of years, Israel was not occupying Bethlehem. And for a period of 70 years, they were slaves to the 
Babylonians and then to the Medes and the Persians. But God said that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. So God orchestrated the plan to bring them back to Bethlehem or to, to the land of Palestine and to settle in Bethlehem. Secondly, God said that Christ would be born of the lineage of David. And through successive dispersions, it came to the point where there was only one person left of the royal family of David. One. And his name was Zerubbabel. And when we locate him, he is in Medo-Persia as a dispersed Israelite under the domination of the Medo-Persians. Only one is left. But God orchestrated the plan to get him back to the land of Palestine in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. So the lineage of David through whom Christ must be born will be fulfilled. You see, I've always said it and I'll say it again. God does not have a plan B. Whenever he makes a plan, that is the plan. And whatever happens... That plan will come to pass. And so I say that to say this to you. When God gives you his word, it does not mean there won't be a fight. There won't be obstacles. There won't be struggles. There won't be difficulties. There won't be opposition. All of these things will come. But if God gives you his word, then God cannot change his word. For God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he not spoken, and shall it not come to pass? Whatever God says, God will do. His words are forever sealed and settled in heaven. And that's a confidence I live with every single day. The assurance that I have that if God says it and I believe it, that settles it. Just have to wait on him and fulfill my part of the covenant relationship I have with God. And so, Israel, or all of the prophecies that were prophesied about the first coming of Christ down to who his mother will be. Isaiah prophesied it 630 years before the birth of Christ. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so we see it in Matthew and we see it in Luke that, that the angel Gabriel appeared to a young woman called Mary who is espoused to Joseph and she's going to be married to him. And the angel says, you're going to have a child. And she challenged what the angel said by saying, that's not possible because in my understanding of how this works, I can't have a baby because I, I am a virgin. And the angel says, don't worry about it. God who made the laws of nature can overrule the laws of nature. And so she said, how is this going to be? She says, well, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to place in you that holy thing. And what was her response? Let it be done unto me according to your word. And so that fulfilled. All of the Old Testament prophecies. And we've mentioned that every book of the Old Testament makes reference 
to a coming Messiah. From the seed of the woman in Genesis to the Passover lamb in Exodus to the high priest of Leviticus to the pillar of fire and cloud by day of Numbers to the lawgiver of Deuteronomy to the captain of the hosts of the Lord of Joshua to the chief and righteous judge of the book of Judges to the kinsman redeemer of the book of Ruth and it will take me a while to go through all the books but in every book in every one Something is mentioned about a coming Messiah. And that is why the 66 books of the Bible, written by 40 different authors, over a period of 1,500 years, with no collaboration between them, has a common thread running through the whole Bible. And that common thread that starts in Genesis is the coming Messiah. Run through the entire Bible. We did mention that there are some versions of the Bible where there's an additional 14 books that is referred to as the Apocrypha. And those books may, uh, uh, are not included in this uh, canon of Scripture because those 14 books do not have the continuity of that thread that runs through the Bible talking about the coming Messiah. Their books on history, their books on legend, their books on, uh, on, on different kinds of myths, their books that uh, may be nice literary reading, but they're not considered to be inspirational. So they're not included. But if you could find some Bibles, some people have added it on. If the book does not make reference to the Lord Jesus Christ in some form, then it is not qualified to be here because prophecy is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything revolves around him. He's the center and he's the circumference of all that God is doing. The entire Bible is about God's plan to send Jesus. It's about Jesus coming. And then it's about the plan of Jesus to come again. And what he came to do was to redeem mankind. And to demonstrate that after dying on the cross, he founded the church of which we are a part. And the church is not Pentecostal or Church of God or Open Bible or Adventist or Anglican. That's not the church. Those are different denominations. The church is made up of every man, woman, and child who is born again by the blood of Jesus and the word of God and in whom dwells the spirit of the living God. That is what makes up the church. And the tags may be, have been created for administrative purposes, may have been created for distinctive doctrinal purposes, but, but it has no bearing on our eternal destiny. Our eternal destiny is determined by our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and our continuous and faithful following Him every moment of our lives, every day of our lives. And so the, the fact is that he has come and he did what he had to do and he has returned. But he will come again. In the gospel of John he says, Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, you will be there also. And then the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians, 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, For the Lord himself shall descend with the trump of God, the voice of the archangel. The dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. And so his first aspect of his second coming is where the church meets him, meets him in the air. And then in, in the gospel, in the book of Acts chapter 1, as he's ascended, Two men in white apparel said to the disciples, Why stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus shall so come in like manner as you have seen him taken up into heaven. That's his return. That's when he comes back to earth. And we will deal with that as we go on this month on the subject of the end times. Now the big question in Matthew 24 That the disciples need to know. And let me just give you a little background to it. Verse 1. They went out. That's Jesus and the disciples. Departed from the temple. Let me explain the temple a little bit to you. When the children of Israel left Egypt. They were a nomadic group of people for 40 years. But God gave them instructions in terms of worship and sacrifices and functions of the priesthood. So they had a movable building. It, it was called a tabernacle. The word tabernacle is, is an old English word. It really refers to a tent. So a tabernacle is a tent. So the first place of Worship and sacrifice was a tent. It met all the specifications that God required. It had the outer court and the inner court. It had the holy place and it had the holiest of holies. It had the priest quarters and all of that. But it was a tent. Whenever they moved, they carried it with them. After they had settled... It was in the heart of David, king of Israel, to build a temple unto God. And so he prayed and asked God if he should do it and what should be done. And God told him, Brother Joe, no, you will not build the temple. I, I want us to understand that not everything we want to do, God will allow us to do it. God may want somebody else to do it. God said, David, you have too much blood on your hands. So I can't allow you to build a temple. That must be very disappointing. When you want so zealous to do something for God and he tell you no. And what did David do? And this is why the Bible often refers to David as a man after God's own heart. He was not perfect, you know. He did a lot of stupid things. But sometimes we forget some of the great things that he did. And, and David said to God, he says, Lord, if I can't build a temple, can you, can you allow me to gather all the material for the temple? All the gold, all the blocks, all the wood, everything that the temple would need. I will gather it. I will get it there. So when whoever is building the temple comes, they will have all the material. And, and God says, yes, go ahead and do that. Sometimes God may want you to do that. Be a gatherer, not a builder. Are you hearing me? We have to understand that. And it doesn't make one greater than the other. It's just that you are fulfilling what is the assignment God gives to you. We have a tendency in the church sometimes to compare who doing more than the other or who's doing what. Listen, the person who stands behind the pulpit has an assignment as well as the person who cleans the building. 
We all have an assignment and we're all going to be rewarded by God adequately. And we need to understand that. And so Solomon built the temple. It took about 100,000 men. Took seven years to build the temple. Material came from all over that David had gathered, but there was one particular piece of material that David did not get. And Solomon had to find it. And so he sent Phoenician ships because he had a, an arrangement with the Phoenicians, which is present-day Lebanon. And these Phoenician ships traveled to a place called the land of Ophir to bring back some trees or the logs of some trees, the almond trees. Many years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the land of Ophir. It's not called Ophir now. And I had the privilege of going to the grove where these almond trees are grown. They are similar in structure to the uh, teak trees. And solid hardwood. And they were transported from there. The land of Ophir is the ancient name for what we know today as Sri Lanka. And that's where the almond trees came from. And so Solomon built the temple. Beautiful temple. It is estimated that the temple today, knowing what Solomon spent to construct that temple, would be about 40 Four zero forty billion dollars U.S. What it would have cost to build that temple, the gold and the and the special works. It was built on thirty-five acres of land on Temple Mount. The outer wall was eighty feet tall and fourteen feet thick. The highest point of the temple was between 60 to 70 feet tall. And the carvings were all inlaid with gold. He built a beautiful temple. When, when the priests came to dedicate the temple. And they came in. And they began to offer worship to God. Before they could perform the act of dedication, Scripture says that the glory of God filled the temple. That the priests were unable to function. I pray God when we come together to do our stuff, that the glory of God will so fill the, 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 the sanctuary as we gather together, that we will just stand in awe. Or maybe fall down in awe. Or maybe sit down in awe and, and, and be amazed at the manifold presence of Almighty God. We are too preoccupied in what we do instead of allowing God to do what He desires to do. 585 B.C., the temple, the children of Israel, by now the nation is divided. They're taken into captivity and the temple is destroyed. And all the gold is taken to Babylon and all the golden equipment and utensils in the temple is taken to Babylon and the temple is destroyed. Left in ruin. 70 years later. On instructions from King Darius of the Medes and Persians. Ezra and Nehemiah were instructed to return. And they took along with them Zerubbabel. That's where he now emerges. As the last of the lineage of David. I'm taking you somewhere on this this morning. 
Nehemiah rebuilt the walls and he was given permission to rebuild a temple, but a very small version. Nothing like what Solomon built. And he did that. That small temple was constructed and the children of Israel used that as their place of sacrifice and priestly oblations. Under the Assyrians, the children of Israel decided to rebel. Between the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians, or between the Medo-Persians and the Greeks, the Assyrians had assumed a short period of power, and the children of Israel decided to rebel. But the Assyrians had a leader called Antiochus Epiphanes. And he made an arrangement with the children of Israel. And after everything was quieted down, he offered a pig on the altar of the temple. And as you know, for the children of Israel, the pig is considered unclean. Desecrated that temple, which was not considered a full temple. And that, so it was never mentioned as the second temple. And that was destroyed by the Assyrians. It wasn't until the reign of the Romans that King Herod decided to build a temple to pacify the Jewish people. It is this temple that the, the, the disciples are showing Jesus. They've now come out of the temple. Massive temple on Temple Mount. And just to let you know, Temple Mount, which is where the Dome of the Rock is, is the exact spot, Mount Moriah, where David took, where, where, where Abraham took Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice to God. The exact spot. And so they come out of that beautiful temple. And the disciples said to Jesus, Have you seen this beautiful temple that we have here? Because what, what Herod did was build a temple with more buildings than Solomon had built. And so the, this is what the disciples are saying to Jesus. And in verse 2, Jesus said, You see all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. In other words, this temple is going to be destroyed and all these stones, and each block stone was five tons. Each piece of stone that was got five tons shall not, shall be thrown down. And then he sat upon the mountain and the disciples asked him privately, verse 3, to tell us when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? When is this all going to take place? When, shall the, when will the temple be destroyed? What will be the sign of your coming? How would we know of your coming and the end of the world? And you read now in Matthew 24, all of the signs that Jesus gave. I just want need you to understand that all of the signs in Matthew 24 have specific reference to the nation of Israel because the children, disciples were speaking from their position as Israelites. And so all of the signs refer to that. But long before these things happen, there's going to be a buildup pointing to these things. Now in Matthew 24, the first sign that Jesus mentions in verse 4, take heed that no man deceive you. For deception shall be the main mean 
means of domination and control. It has always been, but it will be exaggerated in the end times. And so, having read that, let's go now to the book of Revelation. And, and just uh, while you're finding the book of Revelation, to let you know that the study part of this continues on the Tuesday evening. The book of Revelation. Chapter 6. And I want you to hold Revelation chapter 6. While I read one other verse from the book of First Thessalonians. You can turn to it if you wish. Or you could just hold there. First Thessalonians. Verse 18. Wherefore we would have come unto you even I Paul. Once and again. But Satan hindered us. I want you to note that verse of scripture. I will make reference to it again shortly. And then 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I read just two verses. And now you know verse 6. What withholder that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity is already doth already work, only he who now let it will let, until he be taken out of the way. What am I talking about are some of the build up to the return of Christ. And the build up has to do with one, the rejection of Christ and the acceptance of the Antichrist. The way man is, if you reject something, you have to have something else to hold on to. And because man rejects Christ, then he will hold on to the substitute. The pretender. The one that Satan will present. And so in chapter 6 of Revelation, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals... And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse. Now I'll just pause there. And I'd like you to read that at some point. It's going to take me a while to read all of it. What we see here is the initial introduction of the man of sin. He has a significant role to play with Israel. But what will be the build up. To his coming. And that's taking place now. In chapter 6. We have the, what is called. The four horsemen. Of the apocalypse. When we speak of. The apocalypse. That's a reference to the book of revelation. Or a revelation of the end times. The conclusion of all things. The consummation of all things. Ladies and gentlemen, everything will come to an end. There is a commencement, a continuation, and a consummation of all things. It's like us. We had a commencement. We have a continuation. And we will also have a consummation. One day one of us would lie in a box. Because our end in this life has come. That's a reality. We don't like to think about it. But it's going to take place. It's a part of life. And so similarly with all of Man and all of creation, there will be a consummation of all things. Leading up 
before the consummation is the return of Christ. Leading up to the return of Christ, what are going to be the signs? A few years ago, every preacher was preaching about the red moon. And now they stop. I don't believe that the red moon or the moon turned to blood is the red moon that we see. That's an astronomical phenomena that takes place ever so often. That's not what it is. What I believe it is, and is that the moon is now, the moon now has some tenants. It has the Americans, it has the Russians, it has the Chinese, it has the Indians, it has the European. And I think Mr. Kim in North Korea would like to get there too. I believe what's going to happen is going to reach a point of domination and control. Who is in charge? And that's going to lead to war. And that's going to lead to bloodshed. It's going to take place. That's what I believe the moon turned into blood is going to be. Not a red moon that comes up as a matter of the shifting of planetary bodies. But an actual blood will be shed on the moon. And, and, and um, I'm still to be convinced otherwise. If you can, please talk to me. Tell me something else. But that's the way I see it. Now everybody, every Sunday morning, everybody is preaching about the coronavirus. Is it one of the plagues? Listen. What will, there have always been viruses. In the 19, what? 1920 was a Spanish flu. It killed 6 million people. 1958, it was the measles outbreak in the United States of America. 60,000 people died. In, in, the, in the 1820, I think it was, it was the bubonic plague in Europe that killed millions of people. So these things come and go. I'm not here minimizing what this is. And there's a lot of people, you know, the conspiracy theorist comes up. Well, you know, they made this in a lab as they did AIDS and Ebola and all the others. And that is to kill the black man. You know, I, I've heard a lot of that. I'm not getting into those conspiracy theorists. I'm going to tell you that all the major nations of the world have lab laboratories where they're creating and experimenting with all kinds of viruses and somewhere some of them will take off. So whether this one is man-made or whether it has morphed from something else, only time will tell. The point is, when I was about 13 years old, I heard a preacher. He scared the life out of me. In those days, I thought you had to preach and scare people into hell, and I did some of that myself. When I, into heaven. When I was much, um, I think I heard your, your daughter told me, um, Brother Ranjit, he says, I was scared of you, you know, when, when, I, when I hear you preach. The kind of Fury and fire and brimstone. You either repent or you're dead right now. <laughs> you know, it was that, that kind of approach. And, and maybe it was the class I graduated with. I had a, a colleague of mine who graduated with me and he's in Grenada and, and he's doing a funeral and the people weren't taking him on and he stopped. See, I'm going to pray now. And if you all don't come to this altar, I'll bury every one of you one after the other. <laughs> the thing is, nobody has died. So, so God didn't listen to that, uh, that prayer. What we're going to see here, these four horsemen of the apocalypse, is speaking of an emerging trend. That will culminate in this final manifestation. The rider on the white horse, the rider on the red horse, the rider on the 
pale horse, the rider on the black horse, are all one and the same, but different manifestations of the same. So what you are seeing, the rider on the white horse comes offering peace. I have the solution. I will give peace. If you follow me, everything will work well. You see, I have no weapons. Because the Bible says here, he has a bow, but no arrows. Using the equipment of the time. I will solve the problems. Well, we've heard that from politicians from time immemorial. Everybody will hear it later on this year. Everybody has the answer. And few can deliver. Because making a promise is one thing. You know one of the things I found out, Sister Lauren, is that with God, is that he makes promises and he could deliver. And he does deliver. And if you can't deliver, then the promises are worth absolutely nothing. Now, I'll be stopping here in a little while, so don't get worried because I have a lot more to say. But we'll continue on. Right on the white horse says, I will give you peace. I will kill the coronavirus. I will get rid of poverty. I will solve the political issues. You know why he will come saying that? Because we're already noticing it now that more and more the world, the planet Earth, mankind is becoming politically bankrupt. He's, he's run out of ideas. Originally all of the ideas came from Plato and Aristotle and those uh, Grecian uh, philosophers, their political system of democracy, or on the other hand of socialism, or whatever. And then you had the monarchies and the, and the oligarchies, and uh, I remember Mr. Pandey's own, the parasitic oligarchy. All of these came about as man is looking for a system to work. But every system is going to collapse. Every system is going to fail. And planet earth is going to be rudderless. Because of the rejection of Christ. Man would be looking for a savior. A solver of problems. Here comes a rider on a white horse. With no weapons. Saying I will fix your problem. Follow me. And the world will embrace him. But that embrace. Is going to be like what. Cleopatra did. Her pet. Was a snake. And she died. By embracing the snake. And that's what will take place. For the rider on the white horse will soon become the rider on the red horse. Which means war. Because when problems can't be fixed, people will rebel. And when people will rebel, force will be used. And then the blood would be shed. Because man has run out. Or is running out of time. Let me say this. I said it last week. Politically. We're on the edge. One virus. And already the stock market in many parts of the world. Already country, co companies have lost billions of dollars. Already economies are, are you following me? One virus. One. As I said, it, whether it's man-made or, or whatever it is, one. 
what about when there's 10? What about when the viruses may not only be something biological that enters your body, but be a virus that enters the whole world system that shuts down planes in the skies, banking system, medical system. So they have a robot doing surgery on you, Lauren, and a virus enters that robot and they start taking out what it shouldn't take out. <laughs> Are you following what I'm talking about? There's going to be chaos. Now it sounds humorous. It is the truth. The Bible says when they shall see peace and safety. Then shall there come sudden destruction. Just when man thinks he has it covered. Something new emerges. And just when people think this rider on the white horse has solved the problems, war breaks out. There are more guns and, 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 and weapons of mass destruction on planet Earth than there are people to kill. I want you to understand that. We, we have good knowledge of that here in Trinidad and Tobago. I think we have enough stuff around that could take out before you wink. So that's going to lead to famine. Because all resources are going to go into military. And people will start dying for lack of food. The earth will not be producing, the Bible says. And people will desperately try to get food and will not get it. And it reminds me of a story in the Old Testament. Give me a couple minutes more. And it says there's a famine. And two women are sitting down one evening and they're hungry and they're desperate. And they decide there's only one way to survive. That is to kill, cook, and eat their child. Are you hearing me? Word got to the king. And then he realized, because sometimes when the king is sitting in his palace, he still has food. But he doesn't know what's happening around the corner and around the bend. And word got to the king and then he realized how critical it was. That's when he sent for the prophet of God. But there's going to come a time when there will be no prophet of God. This has not taken place as yet. But ladies and gentlemen, I can hear the hoofbeats of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They are approaching. Every day, the news reports are saying that something critical is happening. How many countries possess Weapons of mass destruction or nuclear weapons that could destroy each other. How many labs are producing these deadly viruses? How many guns are in the hands of criminals? How many of us live like prisoners in our homes? How many of us Every moment of the day, we're looking over our shoulder. You see who's following. How many of you have stopped shaking hands? Now you're touching feet. <laughs> huh? Just when we think we had enough sanitizers. Now we realize that don't work. 
anymore. They said alcohol does kill it. The next thing you know, all of you come into church drunk. <laughs> trying to kill the, the bug. <laughs> Are you following what I'm talking about? It's confusing. It's chaotic. Now, I'm not here to be a prophet of gloom or doom. I'm here to tell you this is the reality. And so I close with the words of the old hymn. I wish you could come and sing it just now, Judy and others. My hope is built on nothing less. Not on the military, not on the politics, not on the economics, not on the social order. These are necessary and important institutions. But my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock, I stand all other ground. A sinking sand. Hallelujah. And you better know ladies and gentlemen. Where you stand. On whom you stand. Who you're connected to. It is coming to an end. It will come to an end. Not because of the coronavirus. But because of the whole picture. Is pointing that the return of the Lord. Is imminent. And in leading up to his return. We're going to see an escalation of wars destruction dismay despair worry and disorder on planet earth you and i need to know where our assurance and our insurance is and mine is in the lord jesus christ in fact I am so assured of it that whether I live or I die, I'm okay. I'm a winner anyway, one way or the other in the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand with me, please. Come, come sing the song for me. Ladies and gentlemen, look at me for a moment. Send your home shortly. Where are you today? What is the state of your relationship with God? How ready are you for the trumpet call, the final, the build up? I can't tell you today when he's going to come. I can tell you that it's getting closer. And I can tell you that the signs are very evident. We dealt with on Tuesday, for, to a certain extent, the whole restoration of the nation of Israel. We see the, the collapse that's taking place around the world. We know the effect of this virus. Suppose another one in two months should come up. What effect would it have on people's economy and lives? How will it affect the medical pro profession? How will it affect the growth in the workplace? We're seeing the domino effect. What is this telling us? Is this a matter of chance? Or is there some order of things that's taking place? That's telling us the Lord said, as you as I prepare to come back, look for these signs. Paul wrote to Timothy, said this know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. That means there will be perils of every sort possible. But God knows we're here. And we're going to be here until he takes us out. Amen. So what assurance does he give us? He says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow, under the covering. 
Uh, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when you serve God, he's got you covered. Yeah. Said he's got you covered. Money may run out, but he's got you covered. Politics may fail, he's got you covered. The economy might collapse, he's got you covered. David said, I was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor God's seed begging bread. That's not going to happen because God's got you covered, ladies and gentlemen. But if you are not in relationship with him and following him, then your umbrella is going to collapse in the storm. Are you standing on the solid rock? Sing it for me softly. My hope is built on nothing less. Before I close today's service, on nothing less say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to make sure everything's fine with me. My relationship with God, which is the most important thing. Would you come meet me at this altar for a few moments? Before I close today's service, would you come now? Come quickly so we can get over this part of it. You want to say, yes, Lord, I need your covering. I need you to just, just leave and come. Come quickly. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Just before we sing, and uh, let me wait till these come and stand. I want to make one more appeal. And this is not for you. But if you didn't come, you figure out we have it covered. And I thank God for that. But how many of us have children, loved ones? Some once knew, some never knew. And your deepest burden you carry is for those to come to the Lord, to serve Him. You say, Pastor, can you, can you include my loved ones, my children, my, my spouse, my parents, my whoever they are, this morning? That before all hell breaks loose on this planet Earth, they would find a resting place in Jesus, be saved. And not only saved, but safe in his arms. Then you could come and stand with these here and we'll pray. Sing it again. My hope is come closer. fact of the matter is that the signs around us are very real and some people may say but pastor I've been hearing this since I'm a child but Peter answered it says the reason God has not done it as yet is because he has others to bring in Amen. I want you to make those others your children your spouse your family. Say, Lord, those are the others I'm believing you for this morning. I'm trusting you for it. Wherever they may be, that this morning, right now as we pray, some of the words you have said to them, 
some of the things you've mentioned to them, some of the prayers you've prayed, that right now, just for a moment, can I tell you this? A young man left home. He stopped serving God. Walked away, left home, and he joined the marine, the, the merchant marine. So he became a sailor on a ship, merchant ship. Lived a crazy life. And when he was leaving home, Glenn, his mother gave him a little Bible and says, hang on to this. If you don't want to read it, keep it as a memento from me. And he kept it. And one day they were somewhere in, in the Amazon, up where the ships could go to pick up some stuff. And he decided to go for a swim. Not realizing how dangerous it was. While in the water, he saw behind him just the tip of the snout of this massive alligator coming after him. And he thought he would make a dash for shore. And as he tried to make a dash for shore, right on the shore of the river there was this jaguar. Not the car. This jag was sitting there. And he froze. Debt behind him. Debt in front of him. There's nowhere to go. There are times sometimes God may have to use some drastic measures to get a hold of some of our loved ones as he did for some of us it is in that moment every scripture he heard in church flashed across his mind the reality of God flashed across his mind the words of his mother flashed across his mind all in one moment and a prayer from his heart went up to God because he realized if God don't pull him out of this, nothing else will. The alligator is getting closer and the jaguar has crouched, ready to pounce. And he said, I don't know how it happened, but the jaguar pounced on the alligator. And I was able to get away. What do you think he did? He went back to the ship, went into his little case and the first thing he took out was that little Bible let me tell you many of us have sown some seeds in our children those seeds don't die they don't die but sometimes we see rebellion sometimes we see we see them drifting what we have to do is begin to call them out of where they are in our prayer begin to call their names and, and begin to send some prayer towards them that they can't escape. God hears the prayer of his children. And, and, and the more critical the moment is the more we need to do it. See them come to him. Let's pray. Father, 